Now I have the joy to introduce Joy, Dr. Joy Benhart. Uh, uh, she is an ecologist, a very good ecologist, whose research aims to advance our fundamental understanding of the drivers of biodiversity change and the consequences of these changes for human well-being. So that's that connection, which is what makes your work uh, wonderful. And this is what made you appear in one of my classes. I still remember you came in there. The first question or comment you made, I say, watch her. She's going to fly like something. And, and you've proved it already. It's amazing. You can almost feel it, the first encounter. So, so, so thank you for coming. We're happy to have you back. The, the key challenge you try to study is processes that unite all life on Earth. Another big line there. What unites all life on Earth? Whether you're a human being or you're a whale or you're a little fish, I mean, or a plant for that matter, beautiful line. And the more we understand that, the better for us and our planet. You continue to combine theory, experiments and synthesis to study how living systems change as the environment changes and what these changes mean again for human well-being. So your, your ecology is connected to really the well-being of people, which is super. Now, Dr. Ben Hart uh, is currently a postdoc uh, at Yale. Uh, your title is a Hutchinson Postdoctoral Fellow uh, at Yale University in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, very famous department and famous university. So this is all good science. And you were also, you were also a Neuros Postdoctoral Fellow uh, in McGill and also in EWAC. So there you go. She's already gone to many places already, many departments. I'm saying this for our students and future scholars. Just see the profile and how she's built it up up to now. But more importantly, she's actually our graduate. Yeah, she did a PhD here and uh, uh, Dr. O'Connor's lab, Mary, uh, at the Biodiversity Research Center. And that's how you came to my class. I think already, you have started accumulating awards and it's impressive already. And again, I always think of our, our, our future scholars. If you want to win big awards, you better win the small ones. You started winning awards at grade school or, or, or and then the first degree, second degree. And your latest one is actually the L'Oreal UNESCO NSEC Women in Science Award. That is beautiful. Well done. And, I'm happy that you are here, everybody. Now it's your turn to tell us something. I mean, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Rashid. Thanks for that really wonderful introduction. And thanks to everybody for being here. I'm really, really happy to be back in the FISH 500 seminar series. As Rashid mentioned, this, um, I, I remember sitting in the chairs of Errol, um, seeing all kinds of inspiring science come in. So it's really a pleasure to be here. So I want to start today where ecology began. And, um, and a grand challenge in ecology over the last century has been to understand patterns of abundance, distribution, and diversity of life on Earth. And even though we've been tackling these questions now for centuries, I would argue we still lack a mechanistic and coherent understanding of what drives these patterns. And we're now living in an era of rapid biosphere change, our oceans are changing rapidly. And this is posing a challenge to our most basic ecological understanding of what drives biodiversity patterns and laying bare how much we still don't know about what drives these patterns. And so in the context of rapid scale planetary change, rapid, rapid planetary scale change, ecologists are now urgently challenged to not only understand current patterns of abundance and distribution, but also to project future ecological states as the environment changes, including what these changes mean for human well being. So, in a sense, the core mission of ecology has changed since our field began. And of course, we now know that uh, understanding and making projections in these contexts requires understanding both the human and the biophysical components of these systems. So ecology, as I see it over the next century, has moved beyond a field of study focused on understanding patterns to making projections and answering this kind of core question of how do living systems, including the human dimensions of these systems, 
how do they change in the face of environmental change? And this is maybe one of the most important questions in ecology, and it's also the, the, the guiding question of my research program. So the problem, though, is that the foundations of ecology were built to understand patterns. They were not built to project change, and certainly not to connect this understanding to human well-being. So since I was originally trained as a community ecologist, I'm going to illustrate this problem to you using a classic model in community ecology, the Lotka-Volterra competition model. This is a foundational model in our field. It's been around for almost 100 years and is still widely used today. If you don't know this model, don't, um, don't worry about it. You could probably substitute your favorite fisheries model. Um, all you need to know here is that this model was, was originally used and is currently used to understand patterns in the dynamics of interacting species. So it was used to understand patterns. But how can we possibly use this model to now understand change? Um, for example, a change in temperature and how co competitive dynamics might change as the temperature changes. Well, we can see that this is sort of a tricky problem because the model as I'm showing you here was not built to understand environmental change. There are no, for example, terms here that relate directly to temperature. So we wanna use this sort of approach to understand change we might want to think about how each component of this model respond to temperature. So for example, we might focus on these alpha terms here, which are known as the competition coefficients. These capture the strength of competition. Um, but the alphas here are a bit of a black box. So how, how can we possibly, um, how can we sort of decompose these alphas into underlying mechanisms? We might imagine that to understand how to predict how competition changes with temperature among two interacting species, we might actually need to know how the individual populations respond to temperature. And to do this, we might actually need to understand how individual organisms within those populations are responding to temperature. So we can see that in order to make predictions in the context of changing environments, we often need to understand processes operating at lower levels of biological organization. And this is actually a general feature of developing a mechanistic understanding of change in ecology and evolution. That is that it requires understanding processes operating at multiple scales. So if we go back to this challenge, this major scientific challenge of projecting future ecological states, what I want to ask today is how can we possibly meet this challenge um, in the context uh, in, it's that sort of in a way that sort of meets the urgency um, urgency of the problem. So I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about my vision for how we can meet this challenge. And this is the sort of central approach that I take in my work. So the first component of this approach is to focus on mechanisms, as I just mentioned. And I'm not going to suggest we should focus on all mechanisms. I'm going to suggest we should focus on unifying mechanisms. And what I mean by unifying mechanisms are those that operate across scales, across contexts and across systems. The reason for this is that if we focus on these unifying mechanisms, this allows us to tackle these problems efficiently and lends great predictive power. I wanna mention, of course, that there are many other ways of doing this and meeting this, sort of addressing this challenge that don't rely on mechanism. And I'm very happy to talk about those um, if, if folks are interested later. The second component of this approach is going to require some intellectual risk taking and it's going to require a commitment to sharing knowledge across disciplines. It's going to require us to connect understanding across boundaries, intellectual boundaries, disciplinary boundaries, national boundaries and cultural boundaries and to use established tools in new ways. And my Perspective here is that when, when you're sort of committed to these core values of sharing knowledge and connecting knowledge across scales and, and using established tools in new ways, this is going to allow us to use to do the best possible science, which is going to lead us to the most surprising insights and the most useful of discoveries. And so in my work, while I'm primarily trained as a community ecologist, I draw on understanding of processes across these scales. And a sort of central feature of my approach is to make connections across these scales. So today I'm going to address three major challenges in the context of predicting future ecological states. And I'm going to suggest that a solution to these challenges is to connect understanding across scales. 
the first challenge that I'm going to address is projecting the consequences of aquatic biodiversity change on human nutrition and health. The second challenge I'm going to address is how can we project the dynamics of populations in a warming world. And the third challenge that I'm going to address is how can we explicitly confront the role of natural environmental variability at various timescales. Okay, so the first challenge is how can we project consequences of aquatic biodiversity change on human nutrition and health? So one of the greatest challenges facing humanity is securing a sufficient and nutritious food supply, right? And for many of the world's 7 billion people, food security is an ecosystem service or a benefit that's provided by aquatic ecosystems. And I'm showing you this map here because I want to point out to you that uh, reliance on seafood to meet nutritional demands is not evenly distributed across the globe. I want to um, draw your attention to this orange box in the middle, which, is, which points to tropical coastal regions, which are areas where we see high and increasing rates of nutrient deficiencies, high reliance on seafood for nutrition, and also high rates of marine biodiversity change. So this leads to the question then of how could biodiversity change affect human health and, and well-being? And of course, we know that, that diversity in human diets is a pillar of, of, um, of, of healthy diets. Um, the quantitative and mechanistic links between biodiversity per se and human out health outcomes have not been established. And I would argue this is primarily because biodiversity science has operated largely independently from nutrition and health science. So what I'm going to show you is that when we sort of merge these two fields, we can actually um, gain new insights into this problem. So aquatic species are, of course, valuable in the human diet, not only as a source of calories and protein, but they're also their tissues are rich sources of micronutrients, which are scarce in the human diet yet required for, for adequate health. And so when it comes to understanding uh, the health benefits from seafood, this isn't just a matter of predicting yields. Um, and we can measure the nutritional value of a particular species to the human diet by quantifying the concentrations of these, uh, these uh, micro and macronutrients in the tissues of, in, in tissues of the edible portions of fish species and compare those to widely established public health guidelines. And what I'm showing you here is a metric called recommended dietary allowance. Uh, if you've ever looked at the side of a cereal box, you're probably familiar with this, uh, with this concept. It basically quantifies the amount of nutrient intake that's required to meet the, um, the needs of a particular demographic component of a human population. So one of the most important questions in ecology in the 21st century is, does biodiversity per se, as measured in units of species richness or ecological functional diversity, does biodiversity distinct from the identities and abundance of particular species, does this actually enhance human well-being? So to address this question, we can draw on a very large body of ecological theory known as biodiversity ecosystem functioning theory. Uh, that, has, that has shown us both theoretically and empirically that there's a very uh, consistent pattern between um, or positive relationship between species richness and ecosystem functioning. Uh, and we can quantify the strength of this relationship between species richness and ecosystem functioning by fitting a power function to this relationship. And this scaling exponent here, B, tells us the, the, the magnitude of the biodiversity effect. So what we did here was to draw on this body of biodiversity ecosystem functioning theory and apply it in the context of human nutrition and seafood. So what does this approach look like? Well, we, we can compare a scenario in which we have high biodiversity in the diet to a scenario in which we have low biodiversity in the diet. And if the nutrient concentrations across species are negatively correlated such that some species are high in one nutrient and some species are high in another nutrient, then biodiversity ecosystem functioning theory would lead us to predict that increasing diversity in the diet should lead to enhanced nutritional benefits. 
So here we devise two um, new metrics of human uh, nutritional benefit. The first is the number of nutrient targets or RDA targets that are met per 100 gram portion. And we expect based on biodiversity theory that um, the number of targets should increase as species richness increases if species are complementary in their nutritional profiles. The second metric that we, uh, that we devise is what we're calling minimum portion size. And this essentially quantifies the number of grams of seafood biomass required to reach a, a certain nutritional target. And so, um, and so in this case, a lower number is better from the perspective of human nutrition because we know that seafood in the diet is often limited in terms of biomass. So being able to reach a nutritional target more efficiently is an important component of nutritional benefit. We can then extend this understanding to human well-being um, by predicting that uh, if, if these nutritional benefits are enhanced in, in these ways, this should lead to a larger proportion of the population meet, meeting uh, their RDA requirement. Okay, so we address this question by compiling a very large database of uh, tissue, nutrient, and contaminant concentrations as well as ecological traits in more than 800 species of commonly consumed uh, seafood. Uh, we restricted this analysis to only wild finfish species. We also restricted it to species for which we could identify which body part was included and those observations that we could identify all the way to, to genus and species. And anytime you can pile this sort of large data set of, of, uh, of data coming from multiple sources, of course, quality control is really important. So all of the observations in this data set were subject to rigorous quality control and meet international standards for um, that that um, that just that uh, relate to how the data were collected and how they were processed. So with this new data set in hand, we then used an approach from biodiversity ecosystem functioning science, which is that we simulated diets following what's known as a biodiversity experiment with a replacement design, where abundances in the diet of particular species decrease as species richness goes up. And this, this, this approach is important because it allows us to isolate the effect of species diversity per se. We then, with these simulated diets in hand, we then uh, estimated the biodiversity effect by fitting power functions to these uh, relationships. We also collected data on ecological traits so that we could, uh, we could quantify relationships between ecological diversity, functional diversity, and nutritional benefits. Okay, so what did we find? Uh, I want to first show you this graph on the left, which describes how minimum portion size changes as a function of species richness. And let's first look at this bottom, uh, this bottom line here, which, which, uh, which, uh, relate, which uh, describes protein. So what you can see here is that this line is totally flat, meaning that minimum portion size does not change, uh, not change as species richness increases, meaning that there is no benefit of biodiversity for protein provisioning. However, when we look at the micronutrients, we see these negative slopes, these decreasing relationships, indicating that biodiversity, increasing biodiversity provides a benefit as it reduces the minimum portion size required. And this effect is strongest when we consider all five micronutrients simultaneously. Um, this is of course important from the perspective of human nutrition because human nutrition requires adequate intake of multiple nutrients at the same time. So biodiversity is critical for protein, sorry, not, not important for protein, but critical for the micronutrients. We also found that the number of RDA targets met per a standard 100 gram portion increases with species richness, which is another component of uh, nutritional benefit. Okay, so one of the most surprising and exciting findings from this work is that we discovered that the underlying mechanism that drives these differences between protein being independent of biodiversity and micronutrients like calcium being strongly dependent on biodiversity is the actual distribution of these traits within aquatic assemblages. So what I'm showing you here is the number of species and, and their, um, and their uh, protein concentrations. And what you can see is that protein, is, protein concentrations are actually fairly symmetrically distributed across aquatic assemblages. 
whereas calcium shows a very, very strong, strongly skewed distribution. And that means that increasing biodiversity means you're more likely to include one of these high performing calcium species and therefore biodiversity can, confers a benefit. But what's exciting about this is that we actually have a whole other body of theory in ecology that, that is about studying these trait distributions. And so now that we know that the trait distributions are critical to the biodiversity effect, we can connect this understanding to studying how trait distributions might change with other aspects of environmental change like climate change. And this gives us even greater predictive power. We also found that nutritional benefits don't, are not, um, are not, uh, don't depend entirely or only on species richness. They also are associated with ecological functional trait diversity. And so here, what I'm showing you is that uh, the probability of reaching five micronutrient tar tar targets simultaneously per 100 gram portion increases as the trait diversity, the ecological functional trait diversity in the diet increases. Okay, so what did we find here? Well, what I've shown you is new evidence that biodiversity is critical to reaching micronutrient targets, but not for protein. And I've also shown you new evidence that biodiversity is essential to meet nutritional targets simultaneously. We now, by drawing on biodiversity theory, have established quantitative and mechanistic links between biodiversity and human nutrition. And this allows us to then connect our understanding of what drives patterns in biodiversity to outcomes for human health. And this is important because we, we, we now know that biodiversity uh, is that sort of conserving or, or restoring biodiversity in natural systems will help us meet sustainable development goals, for example, zero hunger, while also protecting biodiversity at the same time. I'll point out here that I don't have time to get into it, but we did observe similar pattern, patterns also at local scales. And we also found that biodiversity actually increases contaminant exposure simultaneously. And if people are interested in that analysis, I would be happy to chat more about it later. Okay, so I'm going to move now on to the second grand challenge for today, and that is how can we project the dynamics of populations in a warming world. So the key question here is how will population abundance and distribution change as the environment changes. So one way we can approach this question is by looking to metabolism and Metabolism is a unifying mechanism because it's a feature that's shared by all of life on Earth. All living things must some, somehow uptake resources from their environment. They must transform these resources within their cells and then allocate the products of this transformation to the various processes underlying maintenance, growth, and reproduction. And the rate at which all of these processes occur is what we call, as ecologists, is what we call the metabolic rate. And one of the most widely observed patterns among ectotherms is that metabolic rates increase with temperature. And we see this across a very wide range of taxonomic diversity, as I'm showing you here. But not only do we observe this pattern across many, many different types of species, the slopes of these relationships consistently reflect the temperature dependence of cellular respiration, suggesting that constraints that operate within cells may actually scale from cells all the way up to ecosystems. And this is what we mean when we refer to metabolic scaling, which is that constraints that operate at fine scales emerge in higher order processes. But any effort to sort of um, use this, this theory and this perspective to project changes in processes operating at higher levels of organization like communities, all of these efforts have, um, have had to assume a relationship between temperature and population level outcomes like carrying capacity. And none of these have been tested empirically. So what, how, can, how can we do this? Well, one way to make pre predictions of how population um, outcomes might change as temperature changes is to trace population demography back to the energy budgets of individuals. And we can do this by recognizing that population growth is essentially an energetic process. That is, individuals must acquire more resources than they need for maintenance and convert these excess resources into new individuals. So if we understand then the temperature dependence of organismal metabolism, 
this should give us insight into population, um, population rates, for example, uh, population growth rate or population carrying capacity. So we have a prediction from metabolic scaling theory that as metabolic demand at the organismal level increases with warming, this should lead to lower carrying capacity. And this might seem kind of counterintuitive, but the reason here is that if resource supply is held constant and as temperature increases, individual metabolic demand increases, then the same supply of resources should be able to support a lower population abundance. And specifically what metabolic scaling theory here predicts is that the slope of this relationship, the decline in population abundance with warming should be predictable if we have information about the slope of individual organismal metabolic demand with warming. But this had not been tested yet empirically. So uh, we set out to test these predictions empirically. And the way we did this was by using a species of phytoplankton called Tetraselmus tetrahelii, which was uh, isolated uh, very close to here off the west coast of Vancouver Island. And I'm showing you this video here to point out that uh, you can see this species is highly motile, it's swimming around. And so we chose this species because it allows us to meet the assumptions of a logistic growth model like I just showed you, which make an assumption that all individuals have equal access to resources. So the experimental design was pretty simple. We established populations at five temperatures and tracked these populations until they reached their equilibrium abundance. But to test this theory, the first step is we need to, we need to estimate how organismal and metabolic rate changes with temperature, because that's a key component of predicting these population level outcomes. So our prediction from metabolic scaling theory and metabolic theory is that organismal metabolic rate should increase with temperature. We measured individual metabolic rate. In this case, it's the rate of photosynthesis. And we found that it, um, consistent with our expectations, metabolic rate increases with temperature, not surprisingly. With this data in hand now, though, we're able to use this model to predict changes in population carrying capacity as temperature increases. And so this quantitative prediction is shown here. This is the prediction based on metabolic theory. So here's what we found. We found that population carrying capacity does decrease with warming, uh, but the, the uh, but the slope of this relationship is not quantitatively predicted by theory meaning that populations at higher, at these high temperatures, the, the population abundance does decline, but these warm, warm environments are able to sustain much higher population abundance than was predicted by theory. So our attempt to use organismal, some information about organismal metabolic demand to predict a population level outcome in this case did not work. Uh, we were not able to quantitatively predict that change in population abundance. So either the model is wrong or there's something going on that we didn't account for. And over the course of this experiment, we actually observed that cell size or body size decrease with warming. And this is consistent with a very widely observed pattern among ectotherms known as the temperature size rule. But our original theoretical predictions based on metabolic scaling theory, as I'm showing you here, they do account for body size and for, for this temperature dependence of metabolism. But you can see that body size in this M term mass is completely independent of temperature itself. So it does not allow us to account for changes, phenotypically plastic changes in, in body size that might occur as temperature changes. So what we did then was to expand this theoretical prediction to allow mass to actually change with temperature consistent with the temperature size rule response. So we've now generated new theoretical predictions that allow for a temperature dependent body size. And when we do this, we actually find that uh, we can quantitatively predict changes in equilibrium abundance if we know changes in individual metabolic rate with warming. So what I'm showing you here now is the same data that I showed you before, but the, but the new theoretical prediction uh, that, that allows for body size to change with temperature is shown in the dash line. And you can see that we can quantitatively predict this change in of equilibrium abundance if we understand how organismal metabolic demand changes with temperature. 
So this is a really exciting finding because it's the first evidence that changes in population abundance with warming are actually mediated by changes in individual metabolic rates. And this is a very sort of leads to um, very uh, exciting insight because it allows us to now link our understanding of how organismal metabolic demands change with temperature and actually use that to make projections at the population level. Okay, I'm now gonna take a moment to, to point out that if we wanna make projections in changing environments, as I know many of, um, many of the folks in the IOF want to do, we need to consider evolution. Um, and so now that I've demonstrated to you that these metabolic traits are important and they're, they're useful to predicting population level outcomes, what we really need to know is how do metabolic traits themselves evolve in rapidly changing environments? This is a very much an open question and it is critical to making accurate projections of population and community level changes. So I address this question using experimental evolution in response to rapid environmental change in resource availability. So we know, of course, that it concurrent with changes in temperature in the oceans, we're also expecting changes in resource supply. Um, so I, we set up an experiment in which we, we impose rapidly changing resource environments by manipulating the concentration of nitrogen, phosphorus, and light within these, uh, these chemostats. And after the period of experimental evolution, we quantified evolutionary change in minimum resource requirements uh, for light, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And minimum resource requirements are uh, a key trait that operate at the individual level that also allow us to make projections at the population and community level. So based on evolutionary theory, we would predict that this, uh, that evolutionary adaptation in resource traits should be subject to adaptive trade-offs. So I'll, I'll illustrate that to you for you here. So um, in, in this case, minimum resource requirements are a situation where a lower value is better because being able to persist with less resources uh, is, is beneficial. So we would expect if, if adaptation is subject to trade-offs that if a particular population improves its uh, uh, competitive ability or lowers its minimum resource requirement for one trait, this should come at a cost of worsening in another dimension. And so if we look at evolutionary change in these two dimensions here, we should expect to see a negative slope that characterizes a trade-off between getting better in one dimension and getting worse in another dimension. However, we found no evidence for adaptive trade-offs here. We were expecting a negative slope, what we actually found is a positive slope, which means that um, multiple competitive metabolic traits improved simultaneously. This is very much counter to what evolutionary theory predicts. And we think it might be because these traits are connected by a metabolism. So for example, if a species is growing under very, very low light, it might need to invest more resources in chloroplasts, which are nitrogen rich, which might also make, um, make that species more efficient at using nitrogen. So it could be that when species are competing for these essential resources, the outcomes of evolution, at least over, over, uh, uh, over into rapidly changing environments might be fundamentally different than what theory would predict. And the reason for this is that, as I mentioned, in rapidly changing environments, what we think might be happening is that species are, are still pretty far away from their sort of efficiency frontier. And this is, um, this is a, borrowing a concept from economics. Uh, what, what, we, what we're seeing here is that species or populations are able to improve uh, improve their competitive ability in multiple dimensions simultaneously. And this might actually be a general feature of adaptation in rapidly changing environments when populations are still far away from some sort of optimum. So this, this, this sort of forces us to reconsider our fundamental evolutionary predictions when it comes to understanding metabolic trait change in rapidly changing environments. Okay, I want to now move on to the third challenge, which is that, uh, that projecting future ecological states requires us to explicitly confront the role of natural environmental variability at various time scales. So I'll illustrate this problem to you with an example. 
So one very common way of making projections of future species distributions in the context of climate change is to scale up from estimates of organismal physiology or estimates of the fundamental thermal niche and to scale that up to make projections of future, uh, future patterns of, of, of species distributions. But the problem with this approach is that this approach of scaling from the organismal fundamental niche measured in the lab to, uh, to observations of species distributions is that what we're seeing is that species distributions can often not be predicted from the fundamental thermal niche as measured under constant lab conditions. Um, so what I mean by that is that what we, what we see here is that uh, species tend to sometimes underfill their niche relative to their fundamental niche or overfill their niche in cold conditions. And so this observation led, sort of prompted a bunch of questions about what could explain the discrepancy between the fundamental thermal niche measured in the lab and the sort of realized thermal niche or our observations of species distributions in nature. Um, could it be other niche axes or species interactions that could explain this difference? But I want to point out there's maybe potentially a, a simpler explanation for what explains the difference between the fundamental thermal niche measured in the lab and patterns of distribution in nature is that the fundamental thermal niche measured in the lab is, is most often measured under static or constant uh, lab conditions. And, um, and because of the nonlinear nature of these curves, we need to explicitly actually consider environmental variation and how it interacts with the nonlinear nature of these curves. So we must explicitly consider environmental variation as we attempt to scale from the organismal to the population level. So we address this question experimentally by setting up an experiment in the lab where we, uh, where we grew phytoplankton populations under constant and fluctuating conditions and asked, how does thermal variability itself alter the realized thermal niche? So the, the thermal niche that we might expect under naturally varying conditions. And what we found is that the, the, the thermal niche or the thermal performance curve measured under variable, uh, variable temperature conditions is systematically different than the thermal niche measured under constant conditions. And actually, uh, this, this effect is directly predictable based on the shape of this curve. So math tells us that we should expect this shift uh, to lower temperatures, and we actually observe this empirically. So now that we've shown that this, this occurs in the lab when we, when we grow populations under fluctuating conditions, we then were interested in sort of scaling up this um, finding to what the, this could mean for attempts to scale up from the organismal niche uh, measured in, under constant conditions to naturally, vari naturally variable conditions. So we drew on a data set of almost 100 phytoplankton species and natural patterns of thermal variability in the oceans. And what we find is that for the vast majority of the species, if we account for natural patterns of environmental variability, the entire uh, thermal performance curve or, or the thermal niche actually shifts to lower, lower temperatures. And this is because most thermal performance curves are actually show this sort of um, negative skew. We had a few species in our data set that showed an, the opposite pattern, um, but these were quite rare. So what does this mean then? Well, what, what this means is that if we account for natural patterns of thermal variability, when we scale up from the organismal to the population level scale in naturally varying environments, accounting for thermal variability alone can potentially explain discrepancies between the fundamental niche and patterns of species distributions. And this is actually a much maybe simpler explanation for what ex sort of explains these discrepancies than, um, than other, other sort of hypotheses related to species uh, interactions and, and that sort of thing. Okay, I'm now gonna just briefly touch on some new work that I'm doing that addresses a related challenge, which is how can we understand how living systems more generally persist in fluctuating environments? So much of what I've showed you today and actually much of the focus of uh, understanding biological responses to fluctuating environments in ecology is uh, premised upon understanding feedback. 
So um, what I'm showing you here on the left is some sort of environmental variable. It could be temperature as it fluctuates through time. And um, usually we understand biological processes in fluctuating environments um, as, as operating by feedbacks, which have some sort of delay built in. However, um, there are actually other ways that living systems can persist in fluctuating environments. And these involve processes that we call feed forward. Feed forwards are fundamentally different from feedbacks in that they, they operate based on cues from the environment. Uh, that allow living systems to essentially predict future ecological or environmental conditions and act in the present to prepare themselves for future environmental states. And this actually uh, draws on um, concepts and theory from systems biology, which has long recognized the role of feed forwards in addition to feedbacks, but we hadn't yet really fully appreciated the role of feed forwards in ecology. So I'll just uh, illustrate to you the fundamental difference between feedbacks and feed forwards in that feedbacks are probably very familiar to us. Um, they are reactive processes. And a, an example of that would be thermoregulation of core body temperature in endotherms. And you can see that feedback processes are characterized by a delay in the response after the internal state deviates from some set point. So in this case, when internal um, body temperature deviates from a set point, a feedback mechanism comes into play. Uh, for example, constriction of blood vessels that returns, uh, that returns body temperature to this internal state. So inherent in feedback is some sort of delay. In contrast, we have uh, here is an example of a feed forward, which is fundamentally proactive. It allows organisms to prepare in advance of some future uh, environmental condition. So, for example, one of the most uh, one of my favorite examples of feed forwards is diel vertical migration in zooplankton. And uh, uh, what we what we know is that zooplankton can actually anticipate future predation risk at the surface based on the rate of change in daylight. And so what these guys do is that when they sense a change in the rate um, of, of light at the surface of the water, they actually swim down to avoid future predation risk at the surface. And this is obviously beneficial because they're not waiting until the light becomes bright enough to, to be exposed to predation. They actually are getting out of the way in advance. So feed forward and these sort of cue based processes are actually really, really common in in, in ecological and evolutionary processes. There's many, many examples of feed forward processes, for example, phenology, circadian rhythms, and, and examples like the diel vertical migrations that I showed you. And now what I'm, what I'm working on is uh, trying to generate sort of an, uh, a general understanding of how living systems rely on cues from their environments because, uh, because understanding these feed forward processes and how they might change as the environment changes, I think will have the potential to dramatically change how we understand community and ecosystem level responses to environmental change. Okay, so I started off this talk by presenting you with this major scientific challenge, which is how can we project future ecological states in the face of our rapidly changing biosphere? I offer to you a solution to this challenge, which relies on studying unifying mechanisms or mechanisms that cross scales and an approach that connects understanding across intellectual boundaries and uses established tools in new ways. And I would argue that this approach is, uh, is, is powerful because it allows us to advance our understanding of living systems and the rate that we need to meet these global challenges while also um, while also improving our ability to secure a sustainable future for humanity. And so with that, I would like to thank all of my sources of funding and my collaborators, and I would be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Joey, for um, a truly fantastic talk. Um, I love the way the arc that you drew across um, your different study components. And I really love um, your suggestion of the solutions of applying these different um, unifying mechanisms. I had a quick, um, well, I don't know about quick, but I have a question to get us started perhaps. 
based on um, the three challenges that you presented today, what is one um, area of work that you're really excited about um, moving forward um, for, with your research? Yeah, I mean, I think what I'm what I'm really excited about now is generating a sort of general understanding of, of um, ecological change that that sort of incorporates understanding of these feedback and these feed forward mechanisms. Because I think they're actually, um, this is sort of a really underexplored dimension of environmental change. That is, how are the cues that organisms are using to predict the future? How are they changing as the environment changes? And there's all kinds of unexplored questions there. So that's that's one, um, that's one aspect of my research that, uh, that I'm pretty excited about now. Um, and then the other is, um, is extending our understanding of the nutritional benefits that we get from seafood over much longer time scales. So I'm now working to look into the deep past using paleo records to address how, um, how nutrient provisioning may have looked in, in sort of very long pre-human history uh, and also how it might change into the future. And yeah, no, I agree and, and I confess I'm a bit biased, but that would be super fascinating. Yeah. Um, so I have a, a question here from um, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, um, I believe you can unmute yourself if you wish to ask your question. Um, so please go ahead. Okay, um, if not, um, I will ask the question for Jocelyn. So Jocelyn asks, I believe Joey mentioned that contamination also increased with biodiversity. Do you have any ideas why? And also, is biodiversity focusing mainly on native species? Yeah, that's a great question. So I didn't show you today, um, but we, we did a very similar analysis where we quantified the relationship between biodiversity and contaminant concentrations in, in fish tissues. And what we find there is that uh, increasing biodiversity actually does increasing, increase contaminant exposure because of the same mechanisms that increase nutritional, um, nutritional benefits. And that is that we see these very skewed distributions of contaminant concentrations in seafood species and therefore increasing, uh, increasing biodiversity exposes you to a wider range of contaminants. However, what we find is that the magnitude of that effect, so when we quantify that B parameter that quantifies the relationship between diversity and, uh, and contaminant exposure or nutritional benefit, the, the quantitative, uh, the value of that slope is actually lower than it is for nutritional benefit. So that suggests that while contaminant exposure does increase with biodiversity, it actually decreases the much lower rate than nutritional um, benefit. Uh, and, and, um, and so that's, that's uh, somewhat, somewhat comforting, I guess. No, absolutely. And there was a second part, just um, whether biodiversity was focusing mainly on native species. Yeah, good question. So in this in this analysis, we didn't um, in the sort of global analysis, we didn't I didn't consider uh, sort of native versus invasive species. Um, what I didn't have time to show you today, but I would be happy to chat about later, is that we also looked at these relationships at local scales within North America, um, focusing on um, diets that are composed only of locally harvested species. So those would be native species. In those, in those, within those diets. And in this case, we actually see similar biodiversity effects, but again, weaker when we look at the local scale versus the global scale. And I suspect this, this has to do with the, um, just the distribution, again, of, of, um, of nutritional traits among a more locally constrained species pool versus a global species pool. Um, Jocelyn says, thank you. So the next question is um, from David Rosen. David, I think again, you can unmute yourself, but um, yeah. otherwise I can read your question. Uh, thank you, Joy. That was a, a fascinating talk. Um, I have a, a comment and then, and then a question and the two are a bit unrelated, but the, the comment was, I was really interested in the first part of your talk as far as nutritional diversity. Um, I work with animal nutrition and work a lot within what's known as the geometric nutritional framework, which looks at why, as you probably know, why individual animals have a diverse diet. But I don't think anyone sort of working 
in that field is really thinking about changes in diversity with climate change, even though there's a lot of coral reef people. And so I'm definitely going to peg them to be looking at your research at, at what the implications of that might be. My other question, though, um, relates to changes in body size with uh, changing um, temperatures. And one of the things I've always wondered how much work there has been done, if any, on changes in life history parameters. So we hear about ectotherms becoming smaller under warmer water conditions, but I'm not sure how much work has been done on things like reproductive rates. Um, so is a, a fish that's 70% of the size, is it reproductively the same or are other parameters changing? I'm wondering if you could maybe comment on, on what's known about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So actually the effect of temperature um, on sort of body size and, and these life history traits that relate to, um, to fitness is actually a major puzzle um, in our field. And the reason for that is that um, is that with decreasing body size, we expect a lower fecundity, but also decreasing, sorry, but also, sorry, warming should lead to decreasing body size, which should lead to lower fecundity because there's sort of this um, observation that bigger is better, but also uh, increasing temperature usually leads to faster development rates. And so uh, if you can develop faster and reach reproductive maturity faster, that should also lead to, um, to sort of positive effects on your population growth rates, for example. So this relative temperature dependence of body size and its um, uh, impact on fecundity versus the sort of developmental aspects of this actually sort of make up a really interesting puzzle. And this isn't really fully resolved across a wide range of species. And of course, it will depend on whether the species reproduces once, maybe once per year or once per lifetime. So there's also sorts of interesting uh, dimensions there that, that need to be considered. Um, but, but yeah, usually it would come down to the relative temperature dependence of development rate versus the effect of body size on fecundity. That's at least the way that most theoretical models would approach this. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Joey. Um, the next question is from Juan Jose. Juan Jose, please go ahead. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Joey. Excellent presentation. I am, was very fascinated. Yeah, I, I am most, I, you know, I am more focused on marine ecotoxicology, and I wonder if you unifying mechanism in your model take into consideration the, the metabolic capacity of biotransformation or enzymatic biotransformation of contaminants with species specific metabolic capability. As you know, fish, marine mammals, and other uh, invertebrates have different capacity to biotransform. Some of them have the capacity to eliminate, some of them no. And um, when we talk about methane mercury, it's a biomagnifying, a toxic pollutant. I wonder about the, the, the biotransformation rate in terms of breaking down this contaminant, no, the basal metabolic capacity influenced by temperature, but the biotransformation rate ruled by enzymatic action. This is a very key uh, component because that pretty much depends the net accumulation in organism and across the food web. Um, that will eventually drive the trophic magnification, it means that increase at each trophic level in the food web or the trophic dilution, which means that contaminant decrease at each trophic level in the food web. Just wondered about your unifying mechanism, whether this can be a factor that was considered or taken into consideration. Thank you. Yeah, so that's a great question. And we didn't we didn't actually explicitly consider that. Although I think what you're raising is, is a really important dimension that if we want to have a mechanistic understanding of how these contaminant concentrations in fish tissues will change, we absolutely should be thinking about those things. So I didn't explicitly consider that. One thing I did consider though is how, how that's related to this is how these different contaminants accumulate in different body tissues. So for example, lead versus methyl mercury versus arsenic, for example, uh, are in some cases under stronger homeostatic control than others. Some tend to be deposited in the bones versus not. And so when that when you go to looking at the edible portion, if if one of these uh, contaminants ends up in the bones and you don't eat the bones, then from the perspective of the of the human nutritional dimension, um, we we would actually expect 
um, lower concentrations within tissues. So I guess what I'm uh, saying here is that an understanding of the actual physiological mechanisms that control the accumulation within various body tissues is, um, is, is absolutely an important component that we need, we need to consider. And there's so much work to be done there. And to my knowledge, this hasn't really been um, incorporated in this context of biodiversity. Thank you very much, excellent. Thank you so much, Joey. Um, unfortunately, we are at time. Um, so we encourage everyone, if you have follow-up questions, to email you directly. And we will also make sure that we send you any of the questions that were in the chat box um, so that you may get a chance to respond to them. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, everybody.